This is a production of Cornell University. Um, as Joyce mentioned, I'm the growth chamber supervisor for the Cornell Ag Experiment Station, and I've had that job for nine years. And uh, while I worked for the Tanksley Lab for almost 20 years, I attended a lot of seminars in this room and never really expected to be giving one. Uh, but here I am. Uh, I actually have something you might be interested in. And uh, I'm very happy to tell you about the two growth chambers that my crew designed and built. Um, and I also want to talk about why we think that these chambers should be the ones that Cornell adopts as we try to move away from the old chambers that we're using now. So to understand what we have now, uh, let's take a quick look back at how we got here. Let me put on, oh, yeah, here we go. There's the prototype. Um, we've had growth chambers at Cornell since 1964. For more than 40 years, each department had their own chambers. Uh, that they controlled, and that's how it was, not just for chambers, but also for farms and greenhouses. Uh, each department had their own chambers, their own specific greenhouses with their own watering staff, their own farms, each with a farm manager and staff and tractors. Um, by 2010, farms, greenhouses, and growth chambers were taken away from departmental control and given to the Ag Experiment Station to manage with the idea that uh, there would be more improved efficiency and we'd reduce the duplication of equipment and personnel. Uh, if you remember back then, Cornell, like the rest of the country, was trying to recover from the economic recession of 2008. And so they were looking for ways to save money. And so now all these facilities could be under one managerial umbrella, so to speak, and uh, growth chambers could be looked at as one single group. And decisions could be made about which chambers we might be able to discard because a lot of them are not only very old, but also um, they were very expensive to operate, and a lot of them weren't even used all that often. So. We did discard about 34 chambers in the first few years, uh, but at about the same time, we were also in having 33 chambers installed at Weill Hall. So we were pretty sure we weren't gonna short ourselves of growth chamber space by throwing away those old ones. Also for some of the old uh, chambers that were still in big demand, we got a chance to retrofit them by replacing some of the less efficient parts. Uh, 22 old walk-in chambers that are out at the Ken Post Lab, uh, that area, got new lighting and computer controls thanks to a grant from NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Resource and Development Authority. And that retrofit worked out really well. The chambers got twice the light intensity at half the operating cost. NYSERDA was so happy that they immediately came back with another grant and uh, we got a chance to put new lighting in a lot of our region chambers. Um, still a third grant was forthcoming right after that and they told us that they would buy us six new chambers if we would agree to throw away 10 of our least efficient ones. And the chamber crew had already done uh, energy analysis on most of our chamber models by then. So we knew exactly which chambers were the least efficient and we were all too happy to throw them away. And today those six chambers that NYSERDA bought us are in operation at Weill Hall. So let's take a look at uh, some of the 125 chambers that we currently are using. Uh, the 1960s uh, brought us the first 35 chambers in a collaboration with Dr. Arthur Watson Dimmick of the Plant Pathology Department and the Environmental Growth Chambers Company, or EGC. Uh, and these chambers are still in use today, uh, down at the Ken Post Lab or New Insectory and Dimmick Lab. Uh, 
also, the growth chamber crew was established at this time to maintain these chambers. And they were based out of the plant pathology department. Got a lot of slide changes coming up here. Um, in the 70s, uh, all the other departments wanted their chambers too. So agronomy, which crop and soils was known back then, and plant breeding, plant biology, and horticulture, they invested in about 40 chambers. Um, they were mostly reach-in chambers from the Shearer Corporation. A large space had already been designed and built into that new Guterman lab that was built out on the edge of campus back then. And uh, about half the chambers went to Guterman. Others went to Bradfield and plant science, and some may have even found their way into individual labs. Um, now the chamber crew, which, whoops, that went too fast there. The chamber crew, um, which was still under plant pathology, was asked to maintain all of these new chambers as well. And at that time, we started charging fees uh, to raise money to uh, buy spare parts for the chambers. This is a, a slide of the Bradfield chamber room in one of its better years. If you've seen it recently, it doesn't really look that good anymore. Um, so over the next few decades, additional chambers were sort of added to the fleet here and there. Uh, maybe a professor would write an equipment grant or brought chambers with them when they came here from another university. Uh, then in 2000 or thereabouts, Emerson Hall was renovated to include a large chamber room in the basement where 23 environment growth chambers were installed and they would serve the research projects in the Bradfield, Emerson, and plant science area. Uh, these were state-of-the-art chambers. They had a central computer and digital controls and um, humidity, which was new for chambers back then. Um, at this point, all of the chambers that Cornell now had were the traditional kind of chambers in the sense that the temperature control was achieved through compressors and refrigeration for cooling and electric heaters for heating. That's the traditional style and it still is the traditional style in most places. Um, in 2009, Weill Hall was built. Um, a large room was set aside in the basement to house growth chambers and today there are 34 chambers at Weill used by faculty and grad students. Um, and these chambers are pretty unique. Uh, they're unique because they don't use compressors or electric heaters to regulate temperature like all the other growth chambers. <coughs> this building was designed so that campus chilled water and building reheat water uh, circulating in pipes overhead uh, would be used to regulate the temperature inside the chamber. Valves would send hot water uh, and cold water into separate coils inside the walls of the chamber and fans would circulate air past those coils. Now here's a, we took the panel off of one of the wild chambers to reveal what's inside, obviously the fans, and here are the two coils that are inside the wall. And this system repeats itself on the, on the opposite wall. Um, this method is much more energy efficient than the traditional way of regulating the temperature in a chamber. Uh, the Weill building architects, Cornell project managers, and Doug Keefe from the AC&R shop got together with the Percival Scientific Engineers to design this system, and it works really well. The temperature is usually maintained to within a few tenths of a degree of the set point, and uh, the people who got together to design this really knew how much energy was going to be required by this many chambers. So they designed a system that really reduced the amount of energy. Um, but even though they, it works pretty well at saving energy, there are some other problems with these chambers. Uh, the most damaging problem is that the, the water system is located on the roof of all those chambers. Um, the plastic plumbing fittings that are part of the hot water supply and return system are located on the top 
And these plastic fittings are rated for a temperature of 140 degrees. But somebody must have forgot to ask the wild people what the temperature of their water was because it's at 180 degrees. Uh, that led to a few problems. Um, after the first year or two, we started getting cracks in those fittings and water would leak out and eventually find its way over the side walls of the chamber or work its way into the light cap where all the wiring was for the lights and the ballasts. And that mix did not go well, now, let me tell you. Um, water would eventually drip through the light barrier and it would appear to be raining inside the chamber. This happened you know, quite a few times. Um, or water might flow right through down the top of that control cabinet and short out the electrical components on its way down. So um, once at three o'clock in the morning, uh, one of those plastic fittings broke completely in half and it sent a geyser of hot water up to the roof of the, the ceiling of the room where that water fanned out and it rained down in all the adjacent chambers. We had to find a valve way upstream to kill the flow because we couldn't get anywhere near there. The water is 180 degrees and you don't want any of that getting on. So um, we eventually uh, shut the water off. And about five or six years ago, I was up on the roof of one of those chambers sponging up the water after another fitting break. And my boss heard what had happened again. And so he came down to check it out. And while I was up there, and when I saw him come in the room, I yelled down at him, hey, we could do better than this at half the price. Um, obviously, I was frustrated again. Um, but I really didn't expect anything to come from it. But it wasn't long after that that I started getting questions like, you know, what exactly would you do to make it better? And uh, Having listened to what the crew was telling me about fixing these problems and listening to them after they fixed a lot of the other chamber problems that we would have, I knew that they knew exactly what it would take to make a better chamber, you know, which, which components last longer, or which ones are more reliable. Um, they had been dealing with chamber failures for years, so who better to come up with a, a lasting solution than the people who are having to deal with this every day. So we had a few meetings, uh, which eventually led to a meeting with the director of the Cornell Experiment Station. The crew described how they would make a very efficient and durable growth chamber. And at the end of the meeting, we were asked to provide an estimate as to how much it would take, how much it would cost, to build a small prototype to sort of prove the concept. Um, after we found a source for a nice insulated box um, and uh, found prices for the best components that money could buy, because I don't want cheap components that are just gonna fail, um, we figured that it would take about $20,000 to purchase all the parts. And now bear in mind that a commercially available chamber of this size will probably cost seven, between seventy-five and eighty thousand dollars by the time it's delivered and installed. So, once we got an account number, we started ordering all the parts. It took months to get everything. The insulated white box took over six months because we tried to order it during their busy season, and we also needed them to make some custom modifications. Uh, the door is normally located in the center of this side of the box, and we needed them to move it to the right and down so that we had room to put the control cabinet on the left. And so we had to wait for their slack time so they could retool their production line. Um, you've, you've seen these boxes often. You go to the supermarket, there's plenty of them there. They all say ice on the side. So I just asked them to send me one without the decal. <laughs> um, the control system took months to get also. We went with Argus and uh, each one of those can cost up to $10,000 each, depending on the components that you would want to have in any particular situation. Um, 
This is the same company that has controllers in most of Cornell greenhouses now. Uh, they have lifetime support for their equipment, which is kind of rare in growth chamber land because if you've got a commercial chamber, most of them stop uh, providing support for you, their controller after about five years. And then you have to buy used parts or you have to buy another controller for thousands of dollars. And you know, when we got 125 chambers, I don't feel like spending thousands of dollars for each one to upgrade their controller. So Argus, their system can call me, text or email me if there's a problem and I can log in at home, find out what the problem is, or I can adjust the settings of any chamber right from my office desk or right from home. So it's very convenient. Um, all the other parts that we needed were readily available. Uh, I can even get some of them overnight uh, and free shipping overnight too. The main parts are really one pump, two heat exchangers, two valves, two coils, a few fans, and a couple of fluorescent fixtures. Uh, the insulated box was set on a pedestal, uh, a sort of metal frame, and that brought the box up to a comfortable working height, uh, but still allowed it to pass underneath doorways. So wherever we intend this chamber to go, we sort of have to walk that route and measure, you know, will it fit in elevators? Can it fit through doors? Uh, these pedestals also have wheels on them and leveling feet, so we can just roll it to wherever we need it to go. Um, the pedestal also provides space underneath the chamber for all the plumbing. So no more plumbing on top of the chamber. We learned our lesson. And we also didn't put plumbing along the sides and the back of the chamber either. That way, these chambers can be stacked side to side and back to back to maximize the number of them we can fit into a room. Because most chamber rooms that we have around in different buildings are really not big enough. Um, this way we can really pack them in. So that was the idea there. Um, if repairs are ever needed, we just need to take that panel off and we can get to all the working, working components. But so far, we haven't had to repair this chamber. Uh, it's been more than four years since it was built and it hasn't stopped working yet. And I've replaced the light bulbs once. It's hard to avoid doing that, uh, but that's been it. And this chamber is very energy efficient. We took the basic concept of the Percival design using the, the chilled water and the building reheat water to regulate the temperature and we improved it a little. And here's how we did it. I want to take another look at the wild coils here. Uh, this is a, a wild chamber. Uh, here we have a coil for hot water and a coil for cold water. Uh, when the chamber needs to warm up, a valve would send hot water into the hot coil and air would blow past that warmed coil and bring warmer air into the chamber. But just before the chamber reaches the desired temperature, uh, the computer control system tells the valve to close. And uh, the very hot, but there's still a lot of hot water in this coil. Um, that's gradually gonna cool off, but before it does, that temperature in the chamber overshoots the set point. So now to compensate for that, the controller tells the cold valve to open up and send cold water into the cold coil. And now this coil is battling this coil for the set point temperature. And that sort of battle just keeps going on and on. It, it kind of lessens over time and the overshooting kind of diminishes a little bit, um, but it's still not as efficient as it could be. Uh, well, I don't know if you can see the red very well. Hopefully you can. Uh, this is a graph of that temperature battle. Um, the yellow line is the set point line. And right now the chamber at 830, the chamber's coming out of day setting and wants to be at 17C for the duration of the night. So the water, cold water is going into the cold coil and it drops the temperature, but look how far it overshoots. And here the hot coil is getting more water and it's coming up here and now the cold coil comes on. 
and this just keeps on going. That's, you know, this is a, an exaggerated example, sort of. Usually it's not a full degree above and below the set point, but the slide is there kind of to demonstrate what's going on. Um, the chamber crew thought, seeing this kind of thing happen all the time, that if the water going into the chamber was already at the set point that you want the chamber to be at, uh, the chamber would only need one set of coils and not two, and the temperature would become much more stable. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, but first, when we built the prototype and tested it, uh, the valves that we thought we were going to do a really good job uh, didn't. It turned out that the valve, it, when you programmed it to open, the minimum it would open was 7% of its full capacity. And that was too much. It sent too much hot or too much cold into the system at any one time. So we had to start looking for another valve. And we eventually found a magnetic valve that would only open a very small amount. And that just let a little bit of cold or a little bit of hot into the system at any one time. Now this chamber maintains the temperature uh, to within a few hundredths of a degree of the set point. That red line now lays down right on top of that gold. So that was the key, is finding that magnetic valve. Here's a, a basic schematic of the plumbing system. There are three things in constant motion at all times on this, in our system. This circulating pump just keeps that water flowing from inside the chamber, from outside the chamber to inside the chamber, through the coils where the fans blow the air past, and then it goes back out again and gets recirculated. All the while, these sensors located at various points along the line are figuring out just what's happening with the temperature in that loop. Um, if for some reason the chamber's warming up a little bit, uh, the controller tells this cold water valve to open. And then when that opens, a little bit of water flows through the exchanger, it comes out cold until the sensor determines that this loop is now at the set point and it will close that valve and now the temperature remains uh, at the set point. Uh, if the chamber is going from nighttime to daytime and needs to go up by 10 degrees, the controller will tell this valve to open up a fair amount so that this loop then becomes 10 degrees warmer. Um, and then as it maintains temperature during the day, these sensors are just kind of monitoring the situation, tweaking those valves a little bit as needed to keep that temperature where it's supposed to be. Um, this system is a little bit more energy efficient than the personal chambers, but it is a lot more efficient than the traditional chambers that it was built to replace. Here's a slide that compares the two chambers. Obviously, that's the prototype there. There is uh, the Shearer 6310. Both of those chambers are the same amount of square feet. And uh, we have 20 of those shears, by the way, scattered around campus. When we analyze the electrical consumption of these two chambers, we set each of them at the exact same uh, conditions, and then we hooked up our power recorders. And those recorders ran for exactly 24 hours. And when it was done, we were able to download these graphs of the electrical activity over that 24 hour period. Um, so obviously the X axis is time, the Y axis is watts. And uh, in this graph right here, the y-axis starts at zero watts. On this graph, the y-axis starts at 2,000 watts. So if I were to superimpose this graph on top of this one, that graph wouldn't even start until, oops, what did I do there? There we go. Uh, this graph over there wouldn't even start till halfway up this one. So it gives you a visual idea of how much less energy this thing uses. When we did all the math, converting uh, watts to kilowatts and time to, uh, instead of 24 hours, to one year, this chamber calculated out to $2,100 of electricity per year. This one, 
325. So that's the savings of 85%. Um, Uh, this chamber is currently being used for research at Weill Hall, and as I mentioned, it's worked perfectly for four years. But, you know, this design can work well for larger chambers, too. And here is a slide of the chamber that uh, my crew just finished a few months ago. This is 10 times larger than the original. The interior square feet is 100. Uh, and it's designed to replace those 22 walk-in chambers down at the Dimmick Lab that are over 50 years old. Uh, all the lights in this chamber, some of the uh, electrical conduit assemblies and the vent louvers were all taken out of these old 50-year-old chambers and repurposed into this one. Uh, those lights were part of a retrofit that NYSERDA gave us, you know, about seven or eight years ago. They're still doing well, so we just reused them. Um, we got another controller from Argus, obviously, and this time we got the insulated box from Bally, which many of you probably know is a large manufacturer of coolers. And they have a large variety of different size boxes that we could get. So this time I told them, just send me one without their refrigeration. No longer required. Um, the total cost for parts for this chamber uh, it was about $30,000. Just $20,000 of it alone went for the controller in the box. Um, we needed bigger fans because of the size of the chamber. It was so much bigger than the other one. But the plumbing parts that we used for this chamber are the exact same ones that we used in the small prototype. The same pump, the same heat exchangers, the same magnetic valves, and we're getting the same result. Uh, this chamber works really well. It maintains very tight temperature control, usually about a tenth of a degree centigrade. Now that's not as amazing as what the smaller one does, but the smaller one is obviously a lot less cubic feet to have to deal with. Um, uh, other than the fans in the sidewalls, all the working parts are located on the back of the chamber. Each part is easily accessible and easily removable for a quick change out whenever that might become necessary. That's, uh, that's another cool thing about these chambers. Um, the same plumbing parts are used in every chamber, so we would only have to stock a, a few parts to be able to be used anytime on any chamber. Um, it's a lot different than the way it is now. We have, to, we have a large part inventory. Uh, the chamber is currently working at Guterman in room 139, and you are welcome to check it out anytime you're up there. You just feel free to walk in. There are plants in there, but it's not an experiment. We just wanted to see how different species would grow in that chamber. Um, I should mention that uh, since Guterman does not have the infrastructure like Weill Hall to support this kind of chamber, we had to design it with its own chiller. Let's see if I can get that without turning it off. There's the chiller and its own hot water heater. Um, so the chamber kind of uses that equipment until such time as uh, we can get a new infrastructure at Guterman to support this kind of system. Um, so now we have a 10 square foot prototype and a 100 square foot prototype chamber. Um, we still need a few different chamber sizes to accommodate all the different kinds of research done here. Uh, for instance, Bradfield and plant science would probably benefit by having some chambers that are designed for Arabidopsis research. Uh, with that in mind, the crew has now started to work on a third prototype. Um, this one has 30 square feet of growing space. Uh, the the footprint of that box is 15 square feet, but the plan is to put a shelf right across the middle, giving us two growing spaces, and each space would have its own light. So that would be 30 square feet total. Um, it is possible that we could use some white LED lights in this chamber. We're looking into it right now. Uh, we would get more energy savings from LEDs, uh, and the lights would almost never have to be replaced. 
this chamber could go 50 years and we may not have to do anything to it. Um, I guess that's wishful thinking, I suppose. Um, once this chamber is finished, we're going to move it to Weill Hall and connect it up to that infrastructure to test it. And then maybe we'll look into a fourth prototype, this time maybe a step-in model with 50 square feet. So that would give us a 10, 30, a 50, 100 square foot size of chamber. Uh, I don't think we would need any different sizes than that. Uh, but we might want to vary the kind of features that are available in these chambers. Certainly, uh, the walk-ins would benefit from having some HID lights rather than just fluorescence for those high light requiring crops. Um, and maybe CO2 capability and some reach-ins or step-ins would be helpful. So we will look into that. Um, so the $64 million question is, so when are we going to start mass producing these things? Um, well, there's some things we got to consider before we jump into it. And the first is, who is going to build them? Because we can't. As long as we're building a prototype, we're okay. Uh, but once we start mass producing them, we are going to need to hire that out and pay prevailing union wage. And I'm okay with that. I would like to collaborate on this kind of thing. Um, but realize that the cost to build them will probably about double. Um, <coughs> our cost to build this, this big one was kind of deceiving. It cost $30,000. I expect labor would about double that. But when you consider that Cornell recently purchased a commercial growth chamber of the same size for $180,000, the $60,000 price tag for this chamber uh, is a little bit easier to take. Um, the same thing applies for the small chamber, uh, but it's not exactly as dramatic. This one was $20,000 for parts, so if labor adds another $20,000, uh, the $40,000 cost for this chamber uh, still beats the approximate $80,000 cost to get a commercial chamber of this size. So now that we've broached the subject of money, uh, the second consideration is uh, where are we going to get it? Um, right now, there are 57 walk in and reach in chambers in operation. And they're between 55 or 45 and 55 years old. Uh, these machines are being trusted with your research obligations. Uh, whether we want to think about it or not, those chambers are going to need to be replaced soon. Um, we really should have been planning on doing that 20 years ago. But I would like to replace those 57 chambers with 62 uh, of the prototype style chambers. And I recently did the math. Uh, 27 walk-in chambers plus 35 reach-in chambers would cost about $7.6 million if we purchased them from a commercial chamber company. If we paid somebody to build them ourselves, it would cost approximately $3 million. So we know that somehow we're going to have to get new chambers pretty soon. I'd like to save $4.6 million when we do it. Um, even a $3 million price tag is hard to swallow. So I would like to do this in a, a gradual way to lessen the impact. Uh, I would like to concentrate on replacing all the chambers in one building at one time and then do the same thing in another building about two to three years later uh, until all the 50-year-old chambers are gone. That way the cost is spread out over time and it's something that we could budget for. Uh, last year, uh, to sort of help with finding a way to purchase chambers, uh, the Cornell Ag Experiment Station set up a depreciation fund for chambers and chamber fees were raised 15% and that money goes into a depreciation fund. So in the extended future, we may have a way to do this in a gradual way, uh, changing out chambers every 30 or 40 years. Um, but in the immediate future, we're still going to need a way to find some money. So. Um, Somehow we'll, we'll get it somewhere. 
Um, there's one more thing to consider. Uh, building these prototypes and installing them at Weill Hall is very easy. That building is set up for them. Um, unfortunately, no other building is set up that way right now. Uh, but some buildings would be easier to modify than others. Bradfield, for instance, there's already access to chilled water here. Same with plant science. We could insert a, a, uh, a heat exchanger right into the chilled water line in the mechanical space directly behind the chamber room. And then plumb in a dedicated loop from that chilled water uh, right into the chamber room and do the same for the building reheat water. That way all the chambers in that room could be served uh, with this infrastructure and it would be not near as big as doing say a Weill Hall or a Guterman. The rooms are much bigger there. Um, uh, so campus chilled water is just not available everywhere. It's not available at Ken Post or in Sectory, maybe someday. Uh, but it's probably never going to be available out at Guterman. Uh, so in that kind of situation, we would have to install a large chiller to generate the amount of chilled water that's going to be required to serve a room full of chambers. Um, the infrastructure there would have to be completely redone. And that is obviously, that would be expensive. But at Guterman, if 40 chambers are served by this one infrastructure, that kind of <coughs> spreads the cost out a little bit. It makes it a little more acceptable. And when you factor in the savings you would get by building these chambers here, combined with the energy savings you get every year for the life of the chamber, uh, the payback rate on that investment of inf infrastructure looks a little bit more reasonable. And we've shown these chambers to people who are in a position to make projects like this happen. And they were very impressed with uh, the accomplishment of the chamber crew. I mean, look at that thing, it's gorgeous. Well, if you like chambers. <laughs> um, but, uh, so they were impressed with it. Um, they, but they also understand all the things that they have to consider before they jump ahead with this kind of project. In the end, you know, there are many, many priorities that need attention to CALS, and growth chambers are just one of them. So I want to show you who's responsible here. Uh, there are two people responsible above all others for the design and construction of these prototypes, and that's Bob Wilson on the left and Mark Daly on the right. They did the whole thing from start to finish. It's their design. Uh, Charles Duffy, the third member of the chamber crew, also helped out by contributing ideas to its design. And he and Bob would bounce ideas off each other for many years. And those ideas eventually led to coming up with this. Um, this chamber crew is really the only reason we can still use 50-year-old chambers here. They really know how to fix them. Uh, Andy Lead and I also contributed a little bit to the design, but it was primarily Bob and Mark uh, who brought this concept to a reality. I also want to thank Peter Paradise. Uh, he was responsible for providing the funds for us to build the large prototype that's out at Guterman. Until recently, he was the assistant dean for CALS facilities, and now he is the associate dean for finance at CALS. And another person who deserves credit and thanks, and plenty of it, is Mike Hoffman. He's the former director of the Cornell Experiment Station. About five years ago, he trusted this crew enough to give us the money to build that first prototype. Uh, he and Glenn Evans were very supportive. Now Jan Nyrop is the head of the Cornell Experiment Station, and he and Glenn continue to give us the support we need. Uh, also John Conklin. He works out at Campus Area, he's uh, in the shop at Campus Area Farms, and he fabricated all those pedestals that the boxes sit on. And last but not least, Anya Tim is an administrative assistant at the Cornell Experiment Station. And she was very essential because she showed me how to put together a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never done this before. So, uh, also she found a source for these, these, uh, translucent 
CUAES logos that light up in the windows of these prototypes when during the daytime. And that's a nice touch, so I appreciate her help with that. <laughs> so um, that is probably more than you ever expected to know about growth chambers in your life. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Lisa. What's the current occupancy rate for Cal's growth chambers? I would say it's in excess of 95%. I can tell you off the top of my head which chambers are available. And it's easy because there aren't very many that are available. So I might have five that are available. So I'd like to, ideally, I would like to have 10% excess capacity so that people don't have to be put on a waiting list when they want a chamber. There's no sin in having a chamber sit idle, I don't think, if, it, if it's ready and available when somebody needs it. And they can be just shut off. You don't have to sit there and run all the time. We can just turn them right off. Can't really do that with the old 50-year-old ones because those refrigeration units don't like to be shut off. They start leaking refrigerant after a while. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Is there any effort to, um, or any thought of spinning this off into a commercial venture? There may be a few funds back into the installation of what growth chambers at? Um, we, that, that, that question kind of almost leads into whether we got a patent on this or not so that we could st start a company. And uh, Cornell sent people out here as soon as that first prototype was built. And they did all the research and told me it's not patentable. Um, and I'm basically, I'd be open to anything that gets us new chambers. If Cornell wants to start a business, it'd be fine with me. I don't want to. Uh, uh, that time has come and gone for me, I think. I'm approaching retirement age, I'm not ready to start a business. But I don't think my crew is that interested in it either. Uh, but whatever we can do to help bring more chambers here is fine with us. So, no problem. Jeff. In that one slide you showed for the energy savings between the prototype and one of the other chambers, it looked like there's a significant savings there. Is most of that the, um, the heat exchanger chilled water setup versus the water refrigeration, or it's, it's mostly that? So, but I was just thinking if you're three versus seven some million dollars, doesn't take into account the savings. Right. In energy, you're going to realize there as well, right. for at least the ones that can hook up to that kind of system. Right. Those two really should be added together to right. get the full impact of yeah. what this thing can do. And average down between, uh, you know, Hooterman versus being able to put them, say, in Bradfield, where you're saying you can do the chill water. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. yeah, we wouldn't have to invest in a chiller in this building. Yeah. Right behind that chamber room is chilled water pipes that we could tap into. Yeah. So. I'd like to start in Bradfield, but just convincing people who might or may not have the money at the current moment. So, is that the sort of thing that can be put into the, the construction itself if they're renovating the building, or is that? Completely... Well, I had heard that they are going to upgrade the infrastructure in this building, so I sent a drawing off to those people saying, behind G12 Bradfield, could you insert a heat exchanger right there? Put a couple of valves in it that we can. We can just tap into that when the time would come, and then we could get the chilled water. So I was told that my drawing went on to whoever's in charge of that project. So well, plant science is going to get renovated first, even, right? And that's well, see, all this is news to me. That, that, yeah, it is. That's, that's good. And Peter, of course, Peter Paradise knows all about that. So he should have that factored in somewhere. Well, there's a grungy old room in the basement, B06. That used to have more chambers in it than it does now. But I've figured out that that room could fit 11 chambers, not just this size, but the one with the double doors on it. We could fit 11 of those down there. And that would be perfect for Arabidopsis research, where a lot of the people in that building are doing yeah. that kind of work. Um, so chilled water isn't far away from that room, and we could bring it in. And Chris Smart and I know about that. Okay. Seriously. I mean, this whole thing, she's, not that she's here, but 
This is something she'd be interested in knowing about, I think. Well, I'd be happy to. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.